Welcome to the Strange and Interesting Podcast, a show about folklore, the paranormal, urban legends, and pretty much anything else that I happen to find strange and interesting. I am your host, Al. And today I have a special guest, Aaron Scott from AudioChick.net. So both Aaron and I are on a Facebook group called Podcast Nation, and every Monday they have a post where people can post that they're looking for a guest for their show or they're willing to be a guest. And Aaron responded that she would be interested in coming on to talk about blues artist Robert Johnson. So how are you doing this evening, Aaron? I am well. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And I guarantee this is going to be an educational experience for me because when it comes to the blues, I know slightly more than nothing. And trust me, I mean (laughs) slightly more than nothing uh, about the only blues song I could probably name is B.B. King's Stand By Me. Okay. Sure, I've heard uh, you know other blues songs over the years, but it's not a genre of music that I've ever really been exposed to. So it's not something that I, I really know anything about. This is interesting because I really don't like to show my age, but the deal is I grew up around uh, Nirvana and all that kind of uh, grunge age era. We in my state of Illinois, though, for many, I think we were on five years now, won state jazz competition. And so our garage band groups, we did not want to do anything like that. We chose blues. So we were into Stevie Ray Vaughan. It was a time that B.B. King was, you know, B.B. King. B.B. King was playing with U2 and um, Eric Clapton. So my first actual concert was with Eric Clapton. So, and then... Yeah, we were sad, and it was near us, since we were north of Chicago in the suburbs, when Stevie Ray Vaughan died in the car crash, uh, or uh, excuse me, helicopter crash in Wisconsin. So it was a big deal for us. Yeah, because it's actually where I am, and I I remember hearing about that, uh, Alpine (laughs) Valley. And a friend of mine was mentioning that they do actually have a memorial there for him. So, yeah, it's sad to think that a rock legend like him died there. And I didn't know that he was really also blues. I mean, I know that blues actually did inspire a lot of forms of modern music that mm-hmm. uh, similar like chords, uh, chord progressions and similar musical structures. And when it comes to blues, that's about the extent of my knowledge. The interesting thing, too, is I'm third-generation Texan. Daddy took me from Dallas to Chicago when I was in junior high. And Stevie Ray Vaughan, there is also, he came from Austin, Texas. I moved back to Austin, Texas after being in the Delta. And this is part of what my podcast is about, uh, traveling down the Delta Blues Highway. And there's a Stevie Ray Vaughan, and his brother still plays in Austin. The deal is, like you said, you weren't aware of the influence. You have a ton. You have all the Beatles, all of those guys, Eric Clapton, everyone. They are influenced by these riffs, these chords, these strings, everybody. The blues was the influence that came out of, you know, or going, transitioning to 60s rock. Before we continue talking a little bit more about the blues, um, so you did mention that you have your uh, your blog that you do at Audio Chick, uh, Delta Blues Highway, and that you were originally from Texas, uh, spent some time growing up in Illinois. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? When I talk to these Delta Blues guys, I tell them I've lose the blues, lived the blues myself. About, we're going on seven year anniversary in November. I walked into the hospital with flu like symptoms. They sent me home and had organ failure about, I think, eight days, days later. Then was in an induced coma for two weeks and then released a day before Christmas. I have lots of little triggers or days of points, 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 because they said, oh, you'll be fine in three months. So then I was like, okay, St. Patrick's Day, hooray. And then 
it took, it's been a long journey. I'm still recovering in many ways with the brain and everything else. The deal was I was going to move my last move to Savannah. I was in Savannah possibly two weeks when COVID hit. And then I was isolated here and was in a car accident, which was the bad news because I got a backtrack. I was recovering from that brain injury from the organ failure and all that. And I was hit by an 18 wheeler. My mother was driving. We were dragged a quarter of a mile uh, up the interstate and over three lanes. We walked away from it, but yes, with shock and everything else, it was interesting. Wow. So I, I can't write music, but I'm able to kind of get a good intro when I do interviews when I can with some blues guys or artists, because I do talk to some very interesting women who love the blues and do some really good, interesting things with blues you know, music as well. Okay. So I was also going to ask uh, how you got interested in the blues. Now, it sounds like you, when you were growing up, you did have some exposure to it. Junior high, I really did like U2. And then when BB came in with that, and Joshua Tree, I think it was, he was in that with that album. I just started listening to B.B. King uh, with Chicago. WXRT had brunch with the Beatles. So I was listening to the Beatles. So that gave me some kind of ideas of things like that with, you know, that bass line. And then, yes, you know, like I said, I don't know how, but my whole, you know, group of kids and people playing, you know, our genre, we were doing uh yeah, Stevie Ray Vaughan. And then, you know, just, I fell in love with B.B. King. And then probably around high school was when the Robert Johnson CDs came out. And so you had that whole box set that came out. And that's where we're getting into Robert Johnson. How would you define blues as a musical style? That's an interesting question. For me, blues is very... People will think it's only sad music. It's not. It's a lot of these artists that I've talked to, they say it's coming from the heart. A lot of times, if you go, say, to New Orleans, jazz will be different riffs or people going off and jamming in a way. Blues will jam as well, but it will be in a different way in keeping into a certain genre of uh, staying with riffs with chords getting technical which my mom is always like "Uh, I don't understand it but there will be kind of a if you're a musician you'll know it'll be an ABA or ABAC type deal where you're coming from one point to one point to one point type thing so ABA coming back to that and you'll even hear that in pop culture right now with some of the English pop culture that's going on you'll hear an ABA Shawn Mendes and things like that you'll hear an ABA you know C type thing with a lot of the blues guys especially in the era that you're hearing like you mentioned with Eric Clapton and those guys that you knew about they and the Beatles they were influenced by people that came from sharecroppers and maybe didn't even know how to read or write so they're writing from a different standpoint of just memory and being able to think like that. The man that I spoke to recently, he uh, was produced by uh, Dave Auerbach with the Black Keys, and he doesn't write anything down. I mean, he's very highly educated, but he doesn't write anything down. He went up to Nashville for, I think it was five days. He said, no, first day, wrote the song. And they came back and told me, come on, let's do it again. He said, eh. The thing we recorded the first day was the one that was nominated for the Grammy. (laughs) (laughs) You mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of it coming from the heart. And, you know, just that's always, I think, the best music is when you do have uh, artists, musicians that do really pour their soul into, you know, really pull their heart and soul into the music that they're writing. And... That's one of the nice things though about music is 
you don't have to really understand a lot of it to appreciate it. A lot of this too, if you'll look into these artists or read history or biographies or things like that, they come from, they'll come from church and then move on into blues or You'll hear about, say, juke joints and the naughty things they did on the juke joints was Saturday night, and then they were going back to church Sunday. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you'll have two different things going on there. But a lot of these guys, yes, well, they were guys then. You didn't have many women. But that being said, you had, like, Ma Rainey and things like that. She was playing as well and singing. And so you did have as many women, and that's... I can't pull it up. I'm not as much of a historian, but it is on my podcast that there was a man who he made me cry saying, Aaron, you're doing the same thing. He spent um, probably over 40 years documenting the blues and the Delta, Mississippi Delta. And people took, uh, two people took pieces of his work and made it into a I don't know if it was a film or, well, it must have been audio because it was a Grammy, but he won a Grammy for it. So he's also in the podcast. So if you go back, you can hear more about history. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you did send me a link to an article about Robert Johnson. So I mm -hmm. did look at uh, some of this stuff. Um, so enough to kind of familiarize myself a little bit. You mentioned Delta Blues. So that was the style that uh, he he did. What is different about Delta Blues from other types of blues? Delta Blues a lot of times is about acoustic per se. Within the travel up from opportunities and things after the Civil War and sharecropping and things, when you've got that migration, you may have the sound with, say, Chicago Blues. It may be more electric. It also may be more the rhythm of the train, per se, than in the Delta. I wouldn't quote me on that, but it is there is a different sound. It is electric versus uh, somewhat aco acoustic. There is also a genre of Betonia blues, and so it's just par partly a region and partly how it's played through there. I can kind of be a blues snob in some ways, but then you can't because so many people are pulling in pieces. This one woman I talked to that I haven't uploaded yet, she lives on the coast, but she's all up and down the highway like I, you know, am talking to and doing my podcast about. And she was a piece of work because she, I saw her on Instagram and I thought she was just a tourist doing things, but she'll take the byways and clean up places that people have left, you know, beer cans at grave sites of other blues men and even like we'll get into with Robert Johnson, people think we don't know where he, well, some historians think he's buried. There may be three different places and markers, grave sites where he's buried instead of being a pig and leaving your whiskey bottle or things, just do a tribute and then take it with you. <laughs> so. And you mentioned the Delta blues highway. Is that like a nickname for a physical highway or is it more just a figure of speech? It's Highway 61. And so that's the also deal with what's kind of great about Mississippi and kind of why I still have a passion for it. And the deal was as well, I'm backtracking as well. I went and got a second master's. I worked for NPR for a while and then left and because I didn't have as many opportunities to do reporting because I was an audio producer and my friend who was a host he left and got a master's as well and started to write about uh, horses and got a master's in equine management so I was like okay that's cool and I went and got my I was inspired by him and I got a master's in southern studies at Ole Miss and I actually my dissertation was on repurposed gas stations and what it was was restaurateurs wanted to be in good locations and the tobacco industry was still is you know decline dec declining ah. and he uh, a lot of these guys own three or four locations so they're saying hey let's come in together or hey 
we still have this gas station, but we have the kitchen and this restaurant guy is saying, Hey, I want to be with my family. So it's a win-win on both sides. And also you don't have to clean. You don't have to pay for all this other stuff. So it's great. You can also have casseroles. So you have people running and gunning to get to the refrigerator to get a casserole and not stay in for the whole thing. And that's also a surprise, especially in Mississippi, that you can buy muffaladas or you can buy Chinese because there's a Chinese in culture because of the railroads way back when things were being built. Also, there are not a lot of interstates in Mississippi. So it is different than other states that you would think of. So Eisenhower didn't feel that great about, you know, we didn't need it in Mississippi. Yeah, I remember uh, I looked at your website and you mentioned that going from uh, analog recording to digital. So I'm I'm guessing that was probably an interesting transition. For me, it really wasn't. We had a class where we were cutting tape, so to speak, true tape. And so that didn't make, I mean, it made sense to me. And then the biggest deal was just fighting people or people in my class about how much information or megabytes you could put on a drive at that point. I went off on, that was my bachelor's degree. I went on to get my master's degree in audio as well. And they would wipe the hard drive off every week. And so it would take mm, probably two hours to upload my thesis again. And I think I had um, maybe three, I don't even know now. I can't even think because of the brain injury from my uh, illness. But what would you'd sit on a thumb drive now was very expensive three drives and it would take hours and kind of gross, but I'd sleep on a couch that Lord knows what happened on that couch. <laughs> but you know, cause it was, I was in an art school. It was interesting cause that film that I did post-production audio for, it was called the pickle jar and it actually got, was uh, animation before Amelie at Regal Cinemas in Los Angeles. So it's a fun little trivia fact. Yeah. It's amazing how far the digital storages came. I think I remember seeing a picture in a magazine that showed what a five megabyte hard drive looked like back in like the fifties or sixties. And it was like the size of your refrigerator. And now you, you can have, you know, portable hard drives that have a terabyte of data and just they're, you could easily put them in your pocket. <laughs> well, exactly. Or I tell people when, when I was teaching, because I was a college professor for a while as well, that, you know, you're holding in your hand a phone. That was pretty much what we sent people to the moon in. <laughs> so it's hard to understand. <laughs> yeah, there's a, I know there's a picture that goes around the Facebook and social media sites every now and then. It says like uh, your smartphone has more computing power than what NASA ha um, had in the 60s. They used it to send men to the moon. We use it to launch birds at pigs. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? I never knew how to use a slide rule, but yes, I knew some other analog things. Yes. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> Getting into Robert Johnson. Yes. It was a very fun folklore and fact. So why don't you start by telling us a little bit about Robert Johnson, Robert Johnson's life and his musical style before we get to some of the folklore about him. Robert Johnson is an interesting character because if you look him up, I think he was, he was 27 or 28 when he died. So he had a real short life. And in that period, he wasn't a very good musician. Then all of a sudden he disappears for a couple years or so or a year and then he comes back and he's great and he gets recorded and so that's where the folklore comes about he like every other bluesman probably couldn't keep his pants up <laughs> <laughs> was married uh, supposedly depending on wikipedia and other sources because there are there isn't a lot known about this man so you have, I think, three documentaries on him and maybe two books. There are only three verified pictures 
they found one other photograph of him that is disputed whether it's a verified photograph of him or not. So this man, it's just, it's just interesting. And that's why there's this folklore, in fact, of him, of what went down with him. And I think that's one of the reasons as well. Plus, when the CDs came out at the time when I was in college, you know, you had a two box CD of him that I became interested in him. And, you know, also just to push out a little more uh, with, oh, brother, we're out there. Are there? He's in that. Yes. Yes. So I think that's kind of fun too, putting him in there as that, as kind of a character, a recording artist. An interesting thing too was, which I think is sad and true of many artists of the time and even now, uh, the resid- residuals did not come to the family. So he kind of got cheated from that. But he didn't get to live to see a lot of the cheating of that either. So. I was reading something that they think he may have, something about his eyes, and one of his eyes and just how his hand was structured, that he may have had some condition because uh, I guess they they think that, well, you mentioned that we're, of the few pictures we have of him, there's, you know, we're not entirely right. sure if they're him, but one of them, it looked like his fingers were a little bit longer than that, which you'd find on a normal person. Right. Now that could be a positive thing or a negative thing. I am not a musician, so I'm throwing out what I've learned by talking to different musicians. That could be a positive on how you structure your chords and everything like that within you know, your finger structuring. B.B. King, actually, I'm pulling off the rails a little bit, actually uh, used a box with one string for a while. And so there are different ways to have techniques. So that is an interesting thing as well. Yeah, so you're looking at a picture, and I think is that one picture where people bring that theory up. He uh, also has a, doesn't he have a ring on? Did you see see that? I think... Uh, yeah, I, I think yeah. so. I'm not not a hundred percent certain. Right. It, so it's kind of hard to say on that. Yeah, there's only one true, and that's on the box set of him, kind of with a cigarette, and kind of that's the one that everyone really loves, and I think is within the Smithsonian when they speak, and also with all the museums that they love to talk about Robert Johnson with. What's interesting is, yes, that he was in Clarksdale, which is where there is a signage that calls themselves the Crossroads of the Blues. And the Clarksdale is a huge tourism place to be. And if you want, and many, well, I did not know this, Australians love the Blues. And that is the highest tourist group that comes to front to the u.s and to clarksdale then you have uk and swedes and all that and they come as well so clarksdale is kind of your your stop point or you can stay and then i usually stay in clarksdale and then travel a lot of times when i do my research and do other things i'll put as much mileage on a rental car i'll stay in clarksdale and do as much mileage as running down Route 66, staying in Mississippi. <laughs> when you mentioned how sometimes uh, your physical features can be a hindrance or sometimes an asset to your musical style, I think Tony Iommi, the mm-hmm. guitarist for Black Sabbath, a friend of mine was saying that he actually had to change his guitar playing style because if memory serves me correctly, he worked in a factory and he lost like Mm -hmm. the tip of his finger or one of his Mm -hmm. fingers. And so he actually had to tune down his guitar a bit. And that may have actually helped the formation of uh, black Sabbath style. Yeah, I would agree with that. You've got to change. You've got to adapt, you know, look at even, you know, basketball players, football players, anything. And then adapting all of a sudden you've got, a different voice per se. So the voice came out or a different sound came out of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another, another example I can think of Rick Allen from Def Leppard back in the early eighties, he was in a car accident and he lost one of his arms. So he, 
you know, had to change his drum set and he had to change his drumming style, but he still performed with the band. And I just thought that was cool how the band stuck with him after he had that accident and they were willing to work with him um, and they adapted their sound to his new drumming style. Agreed. And uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting how as these older men come through or things happen, especially with if they've traveled and have hearing loss or things happen, they're going to change how they do their sets or sound or anything. The other deal is I've met one bluesman who comes from a huge family. He's just decided I'm tired of traveling and I'm going to stay in Clarksdale. Great bluesman, great sound, but you're really, Lucius doesn't want it. Lucius Spiller, he doesn't really want to travel anymore. Then you have someone who's young, who's kind of a BB King protege. He's had to adapt because he was really about mostly the guitar. But then because of traveling and wanting to grow and be the next kind of he's the hope of keeping the blues alive. He's really had to learn and adapt uh, and singing. So it's the same type of thing. So with uh, Robert Johnson, how would you describe his musical style? I think he's kind of a baseline for everybody. Everyone looks at him as a way as our baseline. If you look at Wikipedia and I did recently kind of, cause I had thought about it cause I was thinking, well, okay, more, I'm going to talk about this, this, and this. They say who, you know, maybe did a deal with the devil with or who influenced him or taught him because he's such an influence. I would say he's probably our biggest influence or baseline to blues in general, not just Delta blues. And then you've got so many people every time you see a documentary on how they start, especially 60s music coming from Rolling Stones, Eric Clapton, you know, you don't have many Beatles guys talking anymore, but depending on what documentary, it was all these guys got these records coming out and here we were. Unfortunately, we only had two records, but it was a big influence. Uh, my mother is here, and we were talking today. And the question, too, is what would happen if he had stayed alive? You don't know. Yeah. How would it have evolved? This and that. And I also question that with other people, people who died early, you know? And it's not just artists. It's also politicians and other things. We put people on a pedestal or, and they are heroes. They did work hard. They did do things, but do other things as you grow older or power and other things happen. Does, how does it influence you? Do you stay grounded? Do you, you know, what happens? It happens to all of us. Yeah. So it makes you wonder if he did live longer, you know, what he continue to have evolved as a musician and maybe taken his style in a different direction, would he have stayed the same kind of person he was? Or unfortunately, sometimes you hear stories about rock stars and not just rock stars, but actors and other celebrities who they become world famous and then they they let it get to their heads where you kind of wonder how they get through a door with how big their ego is. <laughs> With his generation, though, it is harder because and because BB King's a little bit later. But you do hear about I don't know if well your listeners know about the Green Book. We do have that movie about the Green Book, and so and there is in Clarksdale Riverside uh, Hotel is part of the Green Book where people could stay. Traveling would be difficult. You have to stay at people's homes to travel. He did a lot of performing out of people's homes, even when he was alive and knew what women would take care of him and things like that. And even he'd be, you know, playing at not someplace and then go home with somebody, supposedly. Kind of where we're going with this is that's probably how he died. And this is also why I always get a drink or I'm careful at a bar on how I get drinks at bars because of Robert Johnson and his supposed death. <laughs> I remember reading something about that. So how, why don't you tell us a story of uh, how Robert Johnson was believed to have died? 
some say there wasn't an official uh, death certificate. And then later on they found a death certificate that said he died of syphilis. Other death certificates or ideas of that say other deaths or things. The story is, is that some say just flirtations. Who knows how far the flirtation went, but something was happening with a married woman. And the man said, the husband said, or she said, I don't recall. And it depends again, which narrative you use. Don't drink out of that open bottle thing. And it was a whiskey type bottle. And he said, fine. And he drank out of another bottle and did not feel well right away. And then later on, a couple days later, I think, died. And and so that's kind of, did he make a deal with the devil? Did he not do well with that? And that's how he died. And in these days and times, I definitely only buy my beers and watch the bartender open a bottle of beer or a can of beer because of that. <laughs> so. A little bit Ladies, of, keep yourself safe. Yeah. <laughs> so the uh, now you did mention the the deal with the devil. So that seems to be one of the things that people remember about Robert Johnson. So what is the story behind his supposed deal with the devil? Many think he wasn't very good with the guitar. Most people say he was decent with harmonica and okay with the guitar. Then there's a hiatus of playing. So there's somewhat documentary or ideas that he just went off. Nobody knows where he went. Then folklore says, supposedly, and many people, and you have that culture with slavery. And even I'm in Savannah right now with voodoo and Gullah and Geechee with that type thing that at midnight, possibly at the crossroads of two roads, U S highways right now, we say highway 61 and 41, I think at uh, midnight, he spoke with the devil and that's when he became a great guitar player. And that's when he was able to travel to Texas and get the recordings he needed and became the recording and guitar player and bluesman that we know. Many people do believe that, and I spoke with a man, which the museum is unfortunately closed because of money, in Tunica, Mississippi. It was the Tunica Museum. Uh, I spoke with him. He definitely was a believer in ghosts. I have seen auras. And I've seen auras and things since I was 16. So I definitely listened to him and believed him. He said that, and he said he'd take me to where supposedly Robert Johnson was buried, that radio stations, if your radio's on, will change or things will happen. So it'll change to a blues song or something like that. I just talked uh, to the um, Mount Zion foundation that works with keeping blues markers and artists that do not have graves or keeping those graves alive and uh baptist mount zion baptist and other uh or black uh small black churches uh within mississippi and i think even texas alive so there is he said one of the three places that robert johnson is thought to be buried is not, but they have a, a memorial. The problem with that is they've had to replace the picture of Robert Johnson on it three times because somebody's taken it. Uh. So please take a picture and not take take the picture if you go. There is off of one site that when I was talking to people or on Facebook, and that may be the place. I love it. It's off of the road. You got to turn onto Money Road to get to <laughs> the grave site. One site supposedly close there is there is a pine tree there. I always thought, and talking with the man with this foundation recently, like I said, I haven't uploaded that episode yet. I just recently spoke with him. He said, I always thought the 
markers or the trees or whatnot was because it was they could not afford a gravestone. And he said, no, that was not it. It was partly in memorial. And I think that's partly because of the African traditions and things like that. So we're getting somewhat into African and maybe voodoo and Gullah type. Well, not Gullah Geechee because that's the island type and coastline. But still, you're getting into a subculture of things like that. Okay. So, so the, a lot of the folklore, it's your standard Faustian type deal where um, someone makes a deal with the devil and in order to get good at something, but usually the person ends up dying young or there's a horrible price that they have to pay some t- somewhere down the line. The one question also is with the folklore is that the devil played with him in the recordings. Hmm. So I thought that was interesting. I recently saw that, that there was possibly a second guitarsman, but you don't really hear it or see it or know who it was. So that might've been the devil. Either way, you know, I've personally, like you and I talked about me feeling or seeing auras. I have not been to those sites. Now I'm really curious. Personally, in Mississippi, I did not go to a lot of old places. I've worked in theater and worked in many old theaters and places. And definitely here in Savannah, I've been in old places. The only place I was in a Confederate uh, cemetery, pretty much. And my car wouldn't start. So that was my only experience within Mississippi. And I just said, knock it off. And then my car started. (laughs) (laughs) You just told them to behave. Tell all those, (laughs) tell the energy to behave and you're good to go. (laughs) So it's not unusual sometimes for different folklore tales to have variations. Now, are you aware, are there any variations to the, story about Robert Johnson is in his supposed deal with the devil? Not that I know of. I think mostly, yes, they believe in his death. Most people don't really believe that the syphilis thing is there. They do believe that he was murdered. Uh, A lot of people do believe they are angry since the CDs and the box CDs came out that the surviving family did not get the money. I think most people enjoy the story and the folklore. I think that especially since it's his influence has been such an impact in music in general and rock and roll and the evolution of rock and roll that people love that type of folklore going into it and hearing that maybe that happened with other artists as well or that type of you know, intertwine comes within all of rock and roll and things like that. And the blues still, you're living, you're you're living a soul. You know, you go to church or you may leave church or you were influenced by church music and then you started to play the blues and your mama wasn't happy with you doing that. And, you know, so you are doing a little devil's music. So, (laughs) well, I'm, I'm a long time heavy metal fan. So trust me, I I know all about devil music and and those kind of things. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But well, actually, here's a question I just thought of off the top of my head. Occasionally Mm -hmm. you'll hear stories about people believing that the ghost of a famous person haunts an area where they died or where they frequented. Are there any places where, people think they've encountered Robert Johnson's spirit? I haven't really heard that. Like I said, all I've heard is just um, the gravesite, possibly in general. The man I talked to that has the gravesite uh, preservation, he suggested, which was funny because the man with the museum that I talked to in the way past before I was sick. So I'm like, "Eh, I don't really remember this conversation. It's just on tape, air quotes because it's all digital now. Yeah. He said that that there had been more and heard more stories. The man with the foundation just suggested you go and play your guitar at where you thought it should be and it would be an influence. The man backtracking in Tunica with the guy who was a big believer said don't go there 
in the dark. So <laughs> I don't know what. And then a friend of mine here in town, who I am recently with, he said, interesting, if there's trees, you could make a guitar out of that. And I said, knock it off. So no, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Leave it, leave it how it is. That's not a horror story waiting to happen, right? <laughs> I don't know if I would want a guitar out of that. That might be a little scary to see what would happen either yeah. way. So. <laughs> It'd be mean for other people and you might, might want to not do that. So. <laughs> now, just considering the times when he lived in the early 1900s, do you think that racism may have played a role in the formation of his legend about how he made this deal with the devil and then just magically became a good guitar player. No, I do not. Okay. I think it's about the culture. People bring that in a lot. And even this man with the foundation. And I brought up the fact that pre desegregation, you did have many highly educated people. You have the historically black colleges and universities. You have people that were Congress people, you have, you know, barbershops, you had lawyers, you had everyone. And part of the deal was in certain pocket. Now it's not everywhere. Don't, don't quote me on it. I mean, there were certain places where it was a huge community. And then all of a sudden it was like, Hey, we're coming on in. And all of a sudden the culture changed. So the town itself that you had this great community changed. I, my, I'm third generation Texan. My mother coming from, you know, second generation. She in, in Texas, where she was, they were up, the black community was upset that they were losing their high school. When people bring up race, it's an interesting question because I've, I grew up in, well, I went to a Catholic school where we had Filipino, Indian, uh, <laughs> a Baptist teacher, an Episcopalian, and, handicapped student there and you know we never thought about it and then I went to you know a public school I was like what 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 so mm -hmm. yes so I mean I've never seen and I mean we were watching all sorts of tv where there were black you know characters on tv so I never thought of you know race or this and so <sighs> this has been unfortunate that this culture has now come to this where we're only speaking about race where we should be thinking about community and coming together and like music bringing people to come come together the pro the only problem was with robert johnson and that they had that community and the music the only problem was you had the green book and they had that problem in the south where they couldn't do things so okay. that's where i would stand on that okay now if uh someone wanted to check out robert johnson's music are there any songs you would recommend as a good starting point Oh, <laughs> uh, this is. I had a professor laugh at me for this because I laughed. This will be for you too. I had a friend who kind of made a metal type, and I was like, What is this mix to make out with? And I was like, What is this? And then I played Robert Johnson to make out with him as well. <laughs> <laughs> and my friend later on when I shared my mentor when I was in undergraduate when I mentioned that and told that story in graduate school he's like both of that is weird air <laughs> I said I know I know I know so now for me I was always playing the full CDs of Robert Johnson so now I really don't have an idea of the favorite song I just kind of drop him down and let him play. And it's partly because it's so old school that it's, you know, a scratchy, you know, it's not clean like we're yeah. used to. So that's why I'm just like, okay, let it rip. <laughs> yeah. And there is something maybe said about listening to those old recordings. Cause I think, you know, the lot of the younger generation nowadays, you know, it's, yeah, they grew up with the, crystal clear audio of CDs and MP3s. So they listen to older stuff, whether it's on records or cassette tapes. And for them, the, you know, the hisses, the pops, the crackles, the white noise is distracting. But I mean, I grew up listening to cassette tapes. So 
and re vinyl records. So for me, it's like more nostalgia than distraction. <laughs> mm -hmm. That needle drop or whatever. And yeah, everything like that. That was great. But vinyl, got, vinyl is coming back. So yes, we can love that. Yeah. So. There, I've heard that there are some artists that still occasionally release albums on vinyl. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I know now they even have, uh, I mean, my, my wife's parents have a record player that you know, plugs into a USB drive mm -hmm. so you can plug it into your computer. So that's neat. The only thing is, though, I mean, cassette tapes are, cassette tape players are actually getting a little harder to find, though, which is kind of a shame because I still have some albums that I've only found on cassette tape and I've never found them on CD. So sometimes listening to them can be a challenge, you know, if you don't have a working yes. cassette player. Yes. Or you had the pencil that you had to sharpen. Yeah, oh, yes. I, up your... I remember those days where, <laughs> yes, um, yes. and there's a lot of good memes that go around Facebook about that. Like there's one that shows a picture of a pencil and a cassette tape. And it's like how to date yourself. You know, if you know the relationship between these two items. I have a funny story where someone texted me a quote mixtape we'll do air quotes on that but it was of a playlist that she thought she was sending to her boyfriend i haven't talked to this woman in three years or more and i said i think you sent this to the wrong person it was very interesting what she <laughs> chose as well and it was nice to connect with her, but it was very interesting, her choices of what she sent to her boyfriend. So, yeah. We'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, are you still with that guy? And she's like, no, different boyfriend. Too. I was like, oh, interesting. So, now yes, sir. Now, you mentioned on your website that you're currently working on a book. So what is this book that you're, why don't you talk a little bit about this book you're working on? There were two. Uh, my web designer put that out there. I was, the book was supposed to be, this podcast is, was originally, I wanted it to be the, like I said earlier, if y'all are listening still, um, about the uh, repurposed gas station food and the people. And what it is, is mostly, and this is the podcast, When once COVID hit and I got in that car accident in Savannah and had kind of PTSD from the 18-wheeler and I was so isolated, my parents said, come on up to Chicago. So I had all this audio and I was like, okay, I have all this Mississippi tape that I haven't used. And I kind of changed it up or called people that I knew and decided because... I'm backtracking again, the friend that had gone and done uh, equine management and been a host at NPR, he, uh, but well, because nobody's racing during COVID, he uh, did a podcast as well. I'm like, okay, make a podcast. And nobody's traveling to eat. So I was like, okay, well, you know, the blues and all these people. So let's do traveling down the Delta Blues Highway. And the biggest deal is, is I want people to know so many people have a notion that uh, Mississippi may be racist or, oh, I don't want to travel here, do this and this. And I want people to know that there's so much more. You can pretty much knock on somebody's door, or be on somebody's porch and say hello, and they're going to tell you or give you uh, directions where to go. This one guy, I have an episode called Kool-Aid Pickles. And he didn't want to do the article on Kool-Aid pickles. And it's, yeah, they put just Kool-Aid in the brine with the Kool-Aid, with the pickle and let it go. He did not want to do this story. And he ended up in Clarksdale, which they, I told you to stay, Crossroads in Mississippi and the Delta. And he uh, talked to a cop at the gas station and said, do you have any idea where somebody might be able to help me with this beat of Kool-Aid pickles. And the cop said, I make Kool-Aid pickles. <laughs> <laughs> and it's that kind of thing that you can ask someone and 
Mississippi is kind of the whole state or at least the Delta can be kind of like a small town. Someone knows someone because I've done other interviews and I'm saying, oh, I'm trying to get an episode of this. And this guy, one guy I interviewed, he said, oh, that's my cousin. And I'm like, mm, okay. And even today I was with my mother at lunch and talking about people like I was still in Mississippi because I was like, oh, so-and-so this, this, and this. And yeah, and so I want people to know, even with the podcast, that it's an audio book that you're traveling down. The podcast is pretty much just because you may not be able to get all the pages that a publisher would want from the book. So we'll see on that. The other deal is because of all that's happened to me, I maybe, and I've started writing a memoir of me and my uh, organ failure was due to a rare a bacterial infection that nobody can get except in Southern California and Southern Texas. So we'll leave it at that. <laughs> and my journey from that. <laughs> now, I think you also mentioned something about working on a book with, that was dealing with oral history. Yes. And so that would be the people of who restaurants that are still going, people I've talked to, the artists that are willing to talk to you for free. <laughs> <laughs> people don't realize for me, you may, with a podcast, a lot of times people think you're only talking one-to-one. -one. I am doing a pseudo NPR versus just pick up the phone, you know, talk one-on-one. -on -one. So I'm audio producing, editing, thing, marketing, and uploading and all that. So it is exhausting. And people don't realize how much work goes into a podcast at times. So yes, it's been a big deal. And so I'm ready to kind of... <laughs> I've been doing podcasting for several years. So I know all about all the work and stuff that goes into it, you know, with the audio editing and you know, especially if you're doing something that involves a lot of research. There was one episode I did a long time ago that I put about 24 hours worth of work into. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of, a uh, lot that goes on, on behind the scenes. I, I think some people don't really think about. Um, so when you mentioned working with oral history, what are some of the challenges of working with uh, sources that are primarily going to be giving you oral history or oral uh, reports? I was interested, and like I said, today was not a good day for me to speak with you. I had trouble with words and finding words. I worked with National Archives. I volunteered at LBJ Library in Austin. It was very interesting. I was transcribing and trying to help with that. The secretaries that worked with the president, Linda Baines Johnson, there were three of them and at different times, of course. And so they had different ways that they quote archived or, uh, you know, Dewey decimals, we'll say, put everything in order. And then when the library opened, they want, when you walk into the main uh, hallway, you'll see every book of everything that he has done in the archives. And you won't see that at a lot of other libraries. And the push was to get it all done. And they had trouble getting it done before the opening. And so these women, you'll hear stories or I heard stories. You can probably, you know, go to the library and say, hey, I want to listen to this or read it because I helped try transcribe it, talking about how they were staying up 24-7 and things like that. What I learned was how in speech, speaking back and forth, we do not speak unless we went to Toastmasters or learned we do not speak in complete sentences we also as you'll hear from me today lots of filler words of ums yes no because you're trying to think of what you're going to say next there's a lot to learn and with oral history the biggest deal is i even found right before i got sick it would have been six months before I did one last trip to the Mississippi. Being an artist, you have one way to organize. It's not the best. You don't label everything the best. Being in COVID, I had to go through different ways of how I organized. 
not the greatest. <laughs> Even my friend who was a journalist, my mentor who was a journalist, I walked into his desk and everything was kabloom on, off on his desk, but he knew how to find things. The I found a interview of Miss Davis, who was B.B. King's cousin's wife. So that became extra episode. Who would have known? That could have been lost. That's an oral history. I have talked to other people. I may have my recorder. And I walked in to talk to Roger. I knew he knew I was coming in uh, for an episode. And he said, oh, so-and-so, the King Biscuit Blues Festival got canceled. Go talk to, she'll be willing to talk to you. And she's a blues artist. So those types of stories or what they want to talk to is interesting. Other things I found just learning is sometimes all of a sudden a question will come up. Sometimes I definitely have some questions or I will have questions that they know I'll be asking so they're not so intimidated. The biggest deal is a lot of times, sometimes I am scared and intimidated because it just is, oh, oh, I'm here. Oh, goodness. Other times they know I'm coming and I have a, I've gotten two compliments that was the best interview they had because they did not expect it. I had a warm-up question that they did not see coming, and we had fun and a rapport first before the interview. So it would not be quite a oral history per se. It would be more of an interview. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank you for uh, joining me for this episode. And before we end the show, I mentioned your website, audiochick.net. Is, are there other places they can they can look or follow you? It's audio chick without the K okay. dot net. And that is the same thing with, uh, the, uh, with, uh, you can find me that at Twitter and audio chick without the K at Twitter and Instagram. Traveling down the Delta blues highway is on Spotify and Apple podcasts and it's on Buzzsprout in some way. I have no idea, <laughs> but people find me there as well. So. And then the hopes are, we're having a hard time doing this right now. I'm co-producing with a very amazing 12-year-old. We're trying to do a sports mascot podcast, but that's in the works. So we'll see about that. Uh, hopefully uh, the next season, I did not think there would be another season of this because I was going to wrap up uh, with traveling down the Delta Blues Highway. I may, I do not know, I'm not promising, travel down the Delta Blues Highway and hit blues markers and just talk to tourists and <laughs> see what they do. So do an oral history like that. But yes, go forward on the sports thing. I was doing the sports mascot thing back in 2007, and I'm re-upping on that. It's a little more difficult now, though, so it's kind of fun, though. I'm sure there's probably a lot more to being a sports mascot than people think i mean i'm I'm sure there's people that think that oh you just put on a costume and go out there but there's probably a lot more to it than most people realize you've got i've been talking to a few live or trying to get the live mascots so the animals and then there are a lot of impromptu or not true mascots that i've been trying to get interviews as well so it's kind of been an interesting journey and that's been a totally I would say more difficult producing and trying to get the interviews actually than this one. So fingers crossed you'll see something in I don't know, a year maybe. I don't know. <laughs> well good luck with uh finishing writing that. Yeah. And, um I'd like to thank everyone for listening and again Aaron I'd like to thank you for joining and until next time everyone stay strange and stay interesting. You have been listening to a presentation of Point of Insanity Game Studio. Visit us on the web at poigamestudio.com. Follow us on Twitter at poigamestudio. Look us up on Facebook and email us at poigamestudio at gmail.com. (laughs) 